Welcome to Unlocking Science. Our goal is to glorify God by studying and unlocking the secrets of His amazing creation. I'm your host, Mr. P, and I'm here with Dr. David Minton today, and we're going to do one of our hands-on episodes and talk about an activity that you can do, and this one's based on the respiratory system. Right. That's right. So why would God give us a respiratory system? What's the purpose of it? Well, we might just take one of the odd purposes first, and that is so we can talk to one another. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we use air from our respiratory system through our vocal cords to speak, mm -hmm. but of course the main function of the respiratory system is to bring oxygen in. Just like when you start a fireplace, you need oxygen for the wood to burn. Absolutely. Our respiratory system needs, our body needs oxygen, mm -hmm. which we get through the respiratory system. Yeah, so our respiratory system, that word respire, is what we use to talk about breathing air in and then letting it go. That's the a process that we go through. Sometimes we call those pieces inhalation and expiration, or we could also call them inspiration and expiration. There are different ways to think about that. Another interesting name is tidal breathing, tidal because the breathing. tide comes in yes. and the tide goes out. All right, so we talked about this more in our episode on the respiratory system. And you can find all the information for this hands-on activity, a PDF download of how to do the experiment we're gonna look at later on, or down in the description, you'll have a link to that on the Unlocking Science page. So when we think about the respiratory system, you've got a model over here of the body, Algernon, our guy over <laughs> here. And if we think about the respiratory system, it's primarily located in the upper torso. Yeah, we of course take in air up here through the nasal cavity, comes down, uh, goes to the trachea, which is hiding back here, and uh, it goes branches to go into the lungs by the bronchi, two lungs left and right, the right lungs bigger than the left lung, in part because the heart kind of leans over towards the left and takes up some of the space that the lung needs. Uh, so we have three lobes on the right, two on the left, and uh, we need to make that lung get bigger and smaller to breathe. And that's done primarily by this muscle right here. That's called the diaphragm. Now we that's can, a pretty thin little muscle. It in sure there. is. We can pull a liver out to give you a better view of it, but here it is. It's a dome shaped muscle and it's skeletal muscle. We have voluntary control over our breathing. And when we inhale, this muscle contracts, and when it contracts, it goes from being a high dome to a somewhat flatter dome, mm -hmm. goes down, and that increases the vertical height of our lung. Well, how can you increase the vertical height of the lung? Air would have to come in to do that. Yes. And so that's part of the mechanics of breathing. The rest of the mechanic, this is the most important, the diaphragm. The next most important would be these little muscles that are between the ribs here. We call those intercostal muscles. There are three layers the outer intercostals, the internal, and the innermost intercostals. They're sort of arranged like plywood, so the fibers run in different directions. Mm -hmm. And when they contract, they raise the ribs. And you may wonder, what would raising the rib have to do with increasing the size of the chest cavity? I think you have a prop Well, we've help us spared no that. expense to bring you the best in anatomical props. And think of the ribs as being like this uh, handle on the bucket here. Uh, they don't come out like this, they hang down our ribs. And uh, when we inhale, the intercostal muscles that are between all these ribs pull the rib up, each rib. And notice when that happens, it creates a space. And so this is making our chest cavity broader. The diaphragm is making it taller, mm -hmm. but when the ribs go up, it increases the breadth. Those two functions together bring air in by creating negative pressure, if we dare call it that, yes. uh, inside the lung. <laughs> There's a lower pressure Lower inside pressure the lung inside than, than out, and mm -hmm. if you're not plugged someplace in your airway, the air should flow, flow right, right in inside. Mm -hmm. So when you think about taking a big deep breath and you puff out your chest, you're basically contracting those intercostal muscles and creating that space for air to come in as the diaphragm's pulling down and we get that air flowing in. So we can see that over here on, on Yorick as well, that curve that you've got down here at the bottom of the ribs. Notice every direction you look at it. From the front, they're going down at an angle. If we turn Yorick around sideways here, notice from front to back, they're going down at an angle. Mm -hmm. 
And even if you look from the back side, <laughs> they're going down at an angle here. So when the muscles between the ribs, uh, when they contract, all of the ribs come up. And when they do, that's our bucket handle. Yeah, that handle effect right there. And uh, if you want to see what life would be like without that added feature to our breathing, you could just wrap a strap or a belt around your <laughs> chest, let out all of the air and tighten it as tight as you can, and you'll be able to breathe, but it'll be all diaphragmatic. It'll be a little harder, I think. We're going to have a little bit more trouble there. Mm -hmm. So if we think about inside the lung, each of those lungs is going to have a different capacity. Now you mentioned that the left lung is slightly smaller than the right, but together we can determine the volume of a lung. So that's what the experiment we're going to show you is dealing with in a, in a little bit. So here we could probably look at this model and think about the capacity of a lung. Let me hold that up for you. Yeah, we, point. if we look at this, so uh, we might wonder, well, how much air can we get into these two lungs? It depends on the size of the person. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. P here would allow more air into his lungs than I would. And I'm six I'm foot giant, tall, but yes. he's bigger than that by a good margin. <laughs> so uh, average, what would you expect for an adult? About six liter, mm -hmm. a liter being a little over a quart, so like seven quarts or so, but yeah, six a liter. A gallon, gallon and a half around there, if you think about a gallon milk jug. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that would be the the total capacity of all the air in our lungs, but we don't use all of that. We have a reserve, and yes. there's a good reason for it. <laughs> Normally, as we're breathing in and out, normal tidal breathing, we have about a half liter that's going in and out. But if we inhale very hard to try to fill our lungs as full as possible, uh, we might get another uh, two liters or so. Mm -hmm of air into our lung. Yeah. And the same when we let our air out, but notice, this is important, we have to use muscles to get the air in. But we don't necessarily have to use muscles to get the air out. Yep. Sort of like a balloon. Sure. If you're going to blow a balloon up, you have to actually use some pressure to get the balloon to blow up. And it's going to expand. Oh, that, that took force. some force, okay. <laughs> but do I have to do something to make the air come out? I, think I just have to open up a little bit here and uh, there it, goes. it does it. Now, we can forcibly push air out in addition to the natural recoil. And by the way, our lung collapses for the same reason the blue one does. It has elastic mm -hmm. tissue in it. And this is like rubber. That's why we call it elastic tissue. Yep. It's a kind of a connective tissue. And so the lung, if it were left to itself, would just love to collapse. So up here in Algernon, uh, this lung would like to be about this size right here. Just a little solid piece, almost solid piece of tissue. Just like a deflated balloon. Just like a deflated balloon. But what's holding it open is not only the air inside that pushes it up against the chest cavity, but this is a nice, wet, shiny surface against the inner side of our chest cavity inside the ribs there. And surface tension forces hold it up against that mm -hmm. wall. And that's kind of interesting. If you use glue <laughs> to glue it up there, when you breathed, it would stick. That would be a very bad case of pleurisy. Bad way to do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so using surface tension forces, the Lord has a way to allow our lung to slip up and down absolutely smooth and lubricated mm -hmm. fashion as we breathe, and yet it won't pull away because yeah. of surface tension force. And it doesn't create excess heat with all that movement and rubbing because of that. that Absolutely. Um, we call that the there. pleural sac. Yes, the pleural sac around there gives it that. Now, if someone were to make surface. a puncture wound right here between the ribs, they said they got stabbed, air can go in through there. And if air comes in, it'll excavate the lung away from the chest cavity and it can suddenly collapse. Yeah, so that would be a collapsed lung. Would yeah, be the we call it a pneumothorax or mm -hmm. collapsed lung. And uh, it's interesting that uh, our body can remove that air. We, I mean, we can help it out, yep. but even left to itself over time, that air will be absorbed and that lung will once again fill that chamber. Yep. Okay, so if we think about the lung capacity of one of the kids watching, it's probably a little less than that six liter maximum. Right. So if we were to just think about our normal breathing, we call that tidal breathing. Just when you're just standing here, just a normal in and out breath. And we had a fairly small volume compared to the total capacity. So you're not always taking as deep a breath as you possibly could with every breath. 
but there are probably some circumstances that that would happen. For example, if you were exercising, what happens to your rate of respiration? It goes up. You take bigger, deeper breaths because your body is using up that oxygen faster and your brain sends a signal that says, hey, I'm out of oxygen, breathe faster. And so your body knows to breathe faster. Did you have to stop and think about that when you were breathing faster, when you were running? Nope, never nope. crossed my mind. <laughs> God's given our bodies that amazing ability to just adjust and adapt that way. But we can control our breathing and we can um, control that diaphragm contraction and those things. So there's a bit of a, a mix between our voluntary and involuntary systems there going on. Just like our eyelids, we can blink our eyelids if we want to, but they blink on their own. So right. a little bit of crossover there. So we're going to be doing a couple of experiments with this activity that are going to let you look at lung capacity. Okay. So if we think about um, your lung capacity. So here I've got a little model of what we saw over here with the diaphragm and this blue glove I've got stretched around here. This would represent the diaphragm muscle that Dr. Men's pointing out over there. This rigid cage around here would represent the rib cage. And then this red balloon I've got inside of here that's totally deflated right now would represent one of the lungs. Trachea and, and lung. There, yeah. All right, so the trachea would be this hole that's coming into the balloon up here. And if I pull down on this diaphragm, let's watch what happens to that red balloon inside. You see it inflate there and then it goes down and it inflates and goes down. So this would be normal tidal breathing, just going back and forth. If I were to take a deeper breath and pull down on that diaphragm or expand that cage, then the lung would open up even more and draw in more breath. So that's a normal breathing pattern that we would experience moving back and forth. So how would you go about measuring that? Well, today we're going to build a lung capacitometer. <laughs> now, I don't think that's a real word. I totally made it up, but we've made a device here that's going to help you measure the capacity of your lungs. Okay. So the things that you're going to need are basically a two liter bottle that's empty, some water, and then some type of graduated cylinder. Now, do you think everybody has a 50 milliliter graduated cylinder? I don't cylinder think so. Right now? No. Okay. So rather than just this graduated cylinder, you could also use a quarter cup measuring cup. That's approximately 50 milliliters. So what you're going to do is you're going to take that and you're going to mark, you're going to pour in 50 milliliters and make a mark with your marker. And you're going to pour in 50 more and make a mark and make a mark. And we're going to do that a bunch of times. And since this is a two liter bottle, I bet they're going to be a little over 2000 milliliters in there. Okay. So you're going to mark out that bottle. You're also going to need a piece of tubing. It doesn't have to be long. Two to three feet would be enough. Uh, this one's a little longer than we probably need. And wait, Claude, get out of here. We need you out of the way. Okay. <laughs> he likes water. I guess he was going for a swim. Okay. We're going to need a container that's got a couple inches of water in it and that I'm going to blow air into here and force water out. So if I fill this to the top, what do you think would happen? I think it would flood all over the table right. and make a mess. And if you did that in your mom's living room or somewhere, you're going to be in trouble. Okay. So you might want to do this near a sink or outside where it's safe to do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this bottle. I'm going to make sure it's filled up right to the top with water. And then I'm going to invert it into this container and try and lose as little as possible. I'm going to put two fingers across the top and try and seal that up. Now I'm going to do a quick flip, get that right into there. I got one little tiny air bubble right there, but that'll be okay. All right. Now here's where I'm going to need Dr. Minton's help. He's going to stabilize that. Let's make sure the numbers are out there. Okay. To the front. I'm going to carefully slip this tube up inside the bottle. And this is a little tricky. I don't want to get, you don't want to pull the bottle out of there. the water. Yep. Okay. Stick that tube up in there a couple inches. Okay. Now you're going to do three different breaths. You're going to do just a normal, just like you do with a normal breath. So just a normal tidal breath. Then you're going to take a big deep breath. Kind of like when you're at the doctor and they ask you to take a deep breath before they're measuring things. And then you're going to try to do one that's as full and deep 
and then press it all out by curling your body down. Okay, so let's see what happens when I just take uh, a nice deep breath and blow into this tube. All right, that's about a normal breath for me. And we can see the water level has come down and it's around 400 milliliters. I've measured that out, right? Now, if I let go of this, water might come squirting out back at us, so we'll be careful with that. But now I know that a normal breath I take occupies about 400 milliliters. Right? So you're gonna be able to measure that value. Now, I'm gonna try and, I'll take this from you now. We're gonna flip it back over without letting all the water flow out because we don't want a mess everywhere. <laughs> there we go. And you're gonna be able to measure the lung capacity of those different types of breath that you're gonna take. Okay? Second activity we're gonna do is using a balloon. Now, a balloon's a little tricky. We can measure the volume of our lung with this balloon, but the balloon has a problem. Like Dr. Men said a minute ago, it's elastic. It's gonna push back on the air, so it's not gonna give us a true reading of our lung capacity. You're gonna do two things with this balloon. First, you're just gonna stand normal. You're gonna take as big a breath as you can and blow as much as you can into the balloon in one big breath. Okay, here we go. I stopped it. <laughs> okay, now that's the full volume there. Now we said that that would be close to five or six liters for somebody like me. That's definitely not that big. That's only about two liters because the air in there is being pressurized. So this isn't the true capacity of your lungs. It'd be a little bigger than this. You can tie this balloon off. Hope that's not making a terrible noise in the microphones. <laughs> and maybe we will. And I can measure, this is approximately a sphere. I can measure the circumference of this two different ways. If you don't have something like a cloth tape measure like this, you could use a string and wrap it around the balloon like this and pinch it off and then hold it up next to a tape measure or a ruler and get the circumference of the balloon. Or you can take a cloth tape measure like this and measure around the balloon and get a circumference. Okay. So here we have a circumference. I'm gonna do this in centimeters. Try and get it the fattest part of the balloon. And I get a measurement of about 61 centimeters, almost exactly. Okay. You're gonna do a second balloon, but this time we're gonna add a little <laughs> trick. Okay. I want you to find something like a, a bar or something that you can stick your hands up above your head and hang from with the balloon in your mouth and then try to do the same thing. While you're hanging, take as deep a breath as you can and exhale it into the balloon. And you're gonna compare the volumes of the balloon. Now, we're not gonna tell them what's gonna happen. You're gonna come up with a hypothesis. If I'm hanging from a bar, then my lung volume will be higher or lower. So you're gonna come up with a hypothesis. And then there's even some calculations you can do if you wanna try and tackle some math inside of this activity. Now, when I think about this activity, I did this for a very specific reason, because it points us to something that happened about 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem on a cross. Why might this connect to that event of Jesus hanging on the cross? Well, you know, it, they say it took normally three days to die on the cross, depending on the condition of the person at the time. Mm -hmm. So the Romans had picked the slowest, most dreadful, most painful way to die possible. You eventually died of probably loss of fluids, uh, uh, fatigue, fever, infection, <laughs> all sorts of things. Uh, but you recall uh, they wanted to get Jesus off the cross and be, because of the uh, Passover coming up, mm -hmm. was it? And uh, they found that uh, Jesus had already died, uh, whereas the two malefactors, they broke their legs. And what would breaking their legs have to do with making them die faster on the cross? Do I dare tell them this? <laughs> Let's that go part ahead. Of, okay. Well, as long as they could hold their body up when the arms are up here, that allowed them to breathe and get their ribs going up and down. But once their body would hang limp, which would happen if you broke the legs, 
then the ability to raise and lower the ribs would, of course, be largely mm -hmm. removed. Not only that, but uh, the neck would hang over the shoulder blades here, and it would be like a slow uh, strangulation. Yeah, pinching off the circulation so, and the flow of air at the same time. Put this whole combination together, blood loss, shock, fever, strangulation, and you can keep yourself from dying by just supporting yourself with your legs. But as soon as the legs are broken, of course, There's then no you couldn't. Support. But why is it that Jesus' legs were not broken other than the fact he was already dead? Mm -hmm. But the Bible had said already in the Old Testament not a bone of his body yes. would be broken. So we have a very clear fulfillment of prophecy in the death of our Savior there. And that death of Christ is the thing that brings us hope because he died bearing our sins on that cross. We can look to forgiveness from God the Father, trusting that the Spirit will work in our hearts to bring that repentance and faith to us and have that hope of eternal life. And that's the best thing I know about a science lesson like this, that we can right. actually learn how our bodies work and point us toward the hope of the gospel. Now, why is it important to you as a science educator to always be pointing to the truth of God's word and things like that in your education process? Well, really, it's so easy to do in, in so many ways. So when I talk about the eye and the ear, I'm often reminded of the verse that People have eyes but don't see the unbeliever. They have ears but don't hear. Lord has to give us the ability for our hearing ears to actually hear and our seeing eyes to see. And then the Lord likened uh, uh, idols that were worshipped uh, mm -hmm. uh, to eyes and ears. He said the idols, which were carved things, had eyes on them but they couldn't see. And they had ears but they couldn't hear. Mm -hmm. And it said those who worship them are like them. And then when I think of respiration and breathing, you know, the Bible defines life as the breath of life. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, creatures that don't actually breathe, uh, uh, worms, uh, invertebrates, things like that, that don't have a respiratory system that brings air in and out through lungs, were really technically not considered alive. Plants weren't considered yes, alive, for example. No, that doesn't mean the Bible's wrong or science is wrong. You can come up with whatever definition you want. It's a different classification want. system. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but in the Bible, a plant would not be considered alive. So when people say, well, death came into the world through sin, then were there cells dying on our body, our skin cells and what have you? Uh, of course, that's not a dying person. Yeah. Those are simply cells that are dying to make our dead layer of our skin. So everywhere I look, I see a Bible verse that's pertinent. Uh, uh, the bones of our body are mentioned mm -hmm. in the Bible, uh, our skin, our muscles. Uh, and it's not a book of biology, but there's a lot of commentary there that reminds us of God's Word. Mm -hmm. All right, so we hope you will enjoy doing this activity, figuring out your lung capacity. You can do it for yourself. You can bring in your brothers and sisters or grandmas and grandpas, moms and dads, anybody. Compare those volumes. Who do you think has the biggest volume in your family? You can do some interesting things and, and try and figure all these pieces out with the, uh, with the capacitometer we've got for you to build there. Now, um, all of this again can be found on the Unlocking Science page on Answers in Genesis website, and there'll be a description or a link down in the description for that as well. We hope you learned a little bit about your lung capacity and we'll get to explore this. And until we see you next time, get out and explore all of God's amazing creation.